Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. My name is Steve Crothers and I'm Sky Scholar's guest presenter today. For the best part of two decades I have advanced several proofs that the theory of black holes is invalid because it violates the rules of pure mathematics as one can learn in these papers. I've also advanced proofs that the special theory of relativity is invalid as it violates the rules of geometry as seen here. This presentation is quite technical owing to the mathematical complexity of general relativity. Consequently, this overview is primarily for those who are conversant with the mathematical methods of the tensor calculus. Nevertheless, the essence of the proof is actually quite simple in principle. Albert Einstein first advanced his general theory of relativity in what are called unimodular coordinates. In these coordinates, his field equations can be written explicitly in terms of his pseudotensor. He introduced this pseudotensor in order to make his theory satisfy the usual conservation laws for energy and momentum. Yet, under a tensor operation called contraction, Einstein's pseudotensor produces a first-order intrinsic differential invariant. Unfortunately for Einstein's theory, pure mathematicians in this paper had proven that the first-order intrinsic differential invariants do not exist. Therefore, Einstein's unimodular field equations are invalid. But Einstein's field equations can be written explicitly in terms of his pseudotensor. This pseudotensor must be valid for the unimodular coordinates formulation to hold. Therefore, Einstein's general theory of relativity is invalid. As a matter of record and reference, the mathematical details upon which this conclusion is based are now provided. Sufficient detail is given to prove that general relativity is invalid. In the end, Einstein violated the rules of pure mathematics in advancing his theory. Regrettably, Modern cosmology is built upon this foundation, and as a result, the consequences are substantial, implying that neither black holes nor big bangs ever existed. Ultimately, this is all a question of pure mathematics. Therefore, I invite anyone confident that the general theory of relativity suffers no fatal flaw to supply their proof of error in my mathematics. Still, I predict that no such proofs will ever appear, as my critics have already had plenty of opportunity to detect any error. Let's now embark upon this mathematical adventure. So that there can be no confusion, I will deal with a definitive presentation of the general theory of relativity which Einstein published in 1915 in this paper, which is available free online from this webpage, and a link is provided below. I suggest that you watch this video with Einstein's paper at hand in order to follow my analysis more or less step by step. I remarked that Einstein's 1915 paper is rather cryptic, this is complicated further by the variety of notation that has been used over the years, much of which is now obsolete. I will note the changes in notation at appropriate points throughout this video. Before considering Einstein's field equations, there are a few preliminary mathematical issues to explain. The first is what is called the metric tensor and its components. In simple terms, a metric is a distance equation. For distance, the length s of the hypotenuse of a right triangle in the three Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z is given by this expression. In differential form, we can write this Pythagorean relation in this way. Note that all these differential terms are defined in this way. The coefficients of the x, y, and z terms are the components of the related metric tensor. The metric tensor is denoted by this symbol. In the case above, for the right triangle, all the components of the metric tensor are just one. Metrics can be generalized to higher dimensions and the coefficients of the coordinates in a metric need not be just one. We can write a general metric in this compact way, where n plus 1 is the number of coordinates involved if 0 is included. We will include 0. As a result, if n has the value 3, the number of coordinates is 4. If you study Einstein's 1915 paper in parallel with my presentation, you will see that he employs a summation sign throughout. But to simplify notation, we can drop the summation sign, which is usual in the literature, and write this instead, where, in general, the components of the metric tensor are functions of all the dimensions or variables that are involved. Note that in this expression, the superscripts u and v are not powers. They serve as identifiers of coordinates. We can denote the coordinates by this notation. And the components of the metric tensor are functions of all the variables x, superscript, i as in this form. Consequently, we can take the partial derivatives of the components of the metric tensor with respect to any of these variables in this way. I must point out now that in his 1915 paper, Einstein used the obsolete method of subscripts on his variables instead of superscripts, so the derivatives of the metric tensor in his notation have this form. 
wherever you see his derivatives, just raise the subscript of that variable thereof to a superscript to comply with a modern notation. It is also important to know that in the tensor calculus, the components of the metric tensor can be written with only subscripts or with only superscripts, or with both subscripts and superscripts in this way. A tensor with only subscripts is called a covariant tensor. A tensor with only superscripts is called a contravariant tensor. A tensor with both subscripts and superscripts is called a mixed tensor. The total number of subscripts and superscripts is called the order of the tensor. We are therefore concerned with tensors of order 2. The metric tensor is symmetric in U and V like this. Now there's an operation on tensors that we will need. It's called contraction. And it can only be performed on mixed tensors because it involves setting one of the subscripts equal to one of the superscripts. Contraction reduces the order of the tensor by 2. In our case, contraction reduces the tensor involved to order 0. A tensor of order 0 is called an invariant. Next in our preliminary mathematical issues is the summation convention. Consider, for instance, Einstein's tensor for the material sources of his gravitational field in its mixed form, like this. Setting u equals v in this expression, we get the invariant t in this way, where I have summed on the suffix v. The rule is that there is summation on a suffix that occurs both as a superscript and a subscript. This is called the summation convention. In this case, v has four values because Einstein's theory involves his four-dimensional space-time continuum. Next in our preliminary mathematical issues is the riemann christoffel symbol of the second kind, which is defined by this expression. Note, however, that this is not a tensor, and further, that it is symmetric in the subscripts. In other words, if you interchange the beta and sigma subscripts throughout, there is no change to the contents within the parentheses, since the metric tensor is symmetric. It is also of utmost importance to note that the riemann christoffel symbol of the second kind is composed solely from the components of the metric tensor and their first derivatives. Constants and specific numbers, such as the half in this expression, have no characteristic bearing. There is an obsolete representation of the riemann christoffel symbol of the second kind, which Einstein used in his 1915 paper, and in an unorthodox fashion. This obsolete form is called the three-index symbol, given on the right side of this expression. Now, the Ricci tensor is a second-order tensor obtained by contraction of the riemann christoffel curvature tensor of the second kind, and it is usually denoted in the literature using the kernel R in this way. In his 1915 paper, Einstein used the kernel G instead of R and wrote the Ricci tensor in this way. Note that Einstein used the subscripts I and M, but it does not matter what particular pronumerals are used as suffixes, provided they are used in the manner consistent with the tensor calculus. So wherever you see I and M in Einstein's 1915 paper, you can replace them with U and V respectively, or any other two different pronumerals you please, provided they do not already appear in the expression. Finally, to see from where Einstein obtained his form of the Ricci tensor, we need the riemann christoffel curvature tensor of the second kind, which is defined by this expression. Rewriting this expression in the three index symbols gives this expression. Now, contract this by setting sigma equal to L to obtain the Ricci tensor in Einstein's 1915 form by this expression. We are now ready to examine Einstein's 1915 paper on general relativity. Here are Einstein's first three equations numbered 1, 1a and 1b in his paper. Note that the Ricci tensor on the left side of equation 1 is broken up into two parts, in R and S on the right side. The R term here is not the Ricci tensor. By using Einstein's equation 4, where he introduces an unorthodox negative sign, namely this expression, Einstein's equations 1 through to 1b can be rewritten in this way. I remark here that Einstein's notation change at his equation 4 can also be written in this way where the brace term is another three-index form for the riemann christoffel symbol of the second kind. Unfortunately, the notation used in the literature is somewhat inconsistent, so we must be aware of this added complication. Now, in the absence of matter, Einstein's equation 1 is equated to 0 to obtain his equation 2, which is this equation. In relation to this equation, Einstein remarked, 
that these equations can be formed in a simpler way when one chooses the reference system so that the square root of the negative of lowercase g equals 1. Then s subscript i m vanishes due to 1b, so that one obtains instead of 2 these expressions. In Einstein's equation 3a, the lowercase g under the radical sign is the determinant of the metric tensor, not the contraction of the metric tensor. This is because the metric tensor can be written as a 4x4 four four symmetric matrix in its components and g is its determinant. Note that g is negative so that the term under the radical sign is therefore positive. Here is the general determinant for the metric tensor in general relativity. Although Einstein used the summation symbol, the uppercase sigma, in his paper, we can drop it from the equations to avoid clutter and conform to the usual representations in the literature and write his equations 3 and 3a in this compact way. You can likewise drop the summation sign everywhere it occurs in Einstein's 1915 paper when you read it. Now you might well ask, what does Einstein mean when he says, then S subscript IM vanishes due to 1b, to arrive at his equations 3 and 3a. To understand this reduction in his equations, we will need this general mathematical relation. Using this general relation, Einstein's equations 1 through 1b can be written in this way. Using these two expressions, his equation number 2 for the gravitational field in spaces in which matter is absent, as he says in his paper, can be written in this expanded way. Recall that Einstein stated that these equations can be formed in a simpler way when one chooses the reference system so that the square root of minus little g equals 1. Applying this condition, called unimodular coordinates, this expression becomes Einstein's equation number 3, because the natural logarithm of 1 is 0, resulting in this expression. Since g subscripts i and m reduces to Einstein's r subscript i m, here I have again dropped Einstein's summation symbols. Now this expression for the gravitational field in the absence of matter can be written equivalently in this way, where the first lowercase t term within the parentheses on the right side is Einstein's pseudotensor, which he introduced at his equation number 8, to try to make his theory satisfy the usual conservation laws for energy and momentum. The pseudotensor is defined at Einstein's equation number 8a and is given by this expression, where the summation symbols have again been dropped. In his paper, Einstein asserted that his pseudotensor is the energy tensor of the gravitational field. In this expression, kappa is just a constant and the delta term is just the Kronecker delta, which is defined by this expression from which it follows that the Kronecker delta invariant in the context of summation is given by this expression, which is just the number of coordinates involved. If matter is present, Einstein's gravitational field equations in unimodular coordinates are given by his equation number 2a, which is this expression. Using the previous expansion of the Ricci tensor, this equation can be written like this. Applying now the unimodular condition gives Einstein's equation number 6, which is this expression. This expression for the gravitational field in the presence of matter can be written in this way. So for both matter absent and matter present, Einstein's field equations can be written explicitly in terms of his pseudotensor for the energy momentum of his gravitational field alone. Let's collate these equations for ease of comparison. Now, contracting the pseudotensor gives this invariant. Since the riemann christoffel symbols of the second kind are composed solely from the components of the metric tensor and their first derivatives, the invariant resulting from contraction of Einstein's pseudotensor is also composed solely of the components of the metric tensor and their first derivatives. In other words, Einstein's pseudotensor produces a first-order intrinsic differential invariant, but the pure mathematicians Giorgio ricci Cubastro and Tullio Levi-Civita proved in 1901 that first-order intrinsic differential invariants do not exist, as you can see in this paper. Here is the theorem these pure mathematicians proved. Riemann metrics of class 0 have no intrinsic differential invariants. Riemann metrics of class greater than 0 have no first-order intrinsic differential invariants. It's clear from this theorem that first-order intrinsic differential invariants do not exist. Therefore, Einstein's pseudotensor is invalid. Therefore, the equations on the right side of the set of equivalent field equations are invalid. Consequently, so too are the equations on the left side. But his unimodular formulation must hold for his theory to hold. After all, it's in the unimodular form that Einstein first presented his completed theory. Therefore, Einstein's general theory of relativity is false.
Finally, any attempt to formulate a set of field equations in terms of the Landau-Lifshitz pseudotensor cannot surmount this outcome because it too, upon contraction, produces a first-order intrinsic differential invariant. To see this, we first need the riemann christoffel symbol of the first kind, which is defined by this expression. Note that the riemann christoffel symbol of the first kind is composed solely from the first derivatives of the metric tensor. Now the landau lifshitz pseudotensor in mixed form is given by this expression. Its contraction gives this invariant. It's clear that this invariant is composed solely from the components of the metric tensor and their first derivatives. That is, it is a first-order intrinsic differential invariant. It is therefore invalid for the very same reason Einstein's pseudotensor is invalid, namely, first-order intrinsic differential invariants do not exist. These pseudotensors are simply meaningless collections of mathematical symbols. They look like mathematics, but they are really just gibberish because they have no mathematical validity. You now have at your disposal a concise mathematical proof that Einstein's general theory of relativity is false. If you would like to explore all the mathematical details of the proof that Einstein's general theory of relativity is false, you can consult this paper. If you are interested in exploring further the falsity of the Einstein and landau lifshitz pseudotensors, you can read this paper. Over the years, none of my critics have ever demonstrated an error in my mathematical analyses. They evidently think that personal attacks suffice. But the fact remains that any mathematical theory must obey the rules of pure mathematics. If it does not, then it has no scientific merit. In this video, I have provided you with a summary of the mathematical proof that the field equations of general relativity are invalid because they violate the rules of pure mathematics. In my next guest presentation, I will provide you with a summary of the mathematical proof that Einstein's special theory of relativity is false because it too violates the rules of pure mathematics. That is all for now. If you enjoyed this video, promote the channel. Mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club. Support with a like or subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon in my next video.